Trust cashiers have so much, or diplomats, or policemen, or positions, as we trust an outfielder or a shortstop. The light which beats upon him would do very well for a throne. The one thing which he is not called, many things as he may be called for his blunders, is a sneak or a traitor. The man at bat, cheer him or hoot him as we may, is supposed to be doing his best. All may be fair in love and war, but in sport, nothing is fair but the rules. The official story is that in 1839, one Abner Doubleday founded baseball in the Cooperstown, New York lot of Farmer Finney. But the official story is not true. It is believed that Doubleday was never in Cooperstown in 1839, as he was attending West Point at the time. The fiction is due to baseball tycoon Albert Spaulding, a man known for his footballs, basketballs, baseballs, who felt that the country needed a patriotic justification for baseball. At Spaulding's urging, the Mills Commission of 1907 decided that the story of Doubleday, Cooperstown, 1839, was to be the official version of the beginning of baseball. Doubleday was perfect for Spaulding's purposes. He was well known for his Civil War record, having fired the first shot at Fort Sumter in 1861, and was a hero at the Battle of Gettysburg. Branch Rickey in later years was quoted as saying, the only thing after Doubleday started was the Civil War. getting a little ahead of ourselves. Let's look back in time to the origins of what has become America's national pastime. Versions of baseball have been found as early as the 1700s. Then the game was known as rounders or old cats, stool ball and goal ball. Stool ball and goal ball began at Easter festivals in medieval England as well as parts of the continent. All of these games feature the elements of modern baseball, pitching, hitting, and rounding a certain number of bases in order to score runs. They also had outs and innings. Not held over from older times is what was then called soaking, throwing the ball at the base runner in order to get him out. Now, of course, that is not done in modern baseball. Written accounts of the time tell of a game of base being played by General George Washington's troops at Valley Forge. As early as 1831 in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania and Camden, New Jersey, there were clubs formed for the play of town ball. Wooden stakes were used for the bases and the layout of the playing area was in the shape of a square. As to the models used to form the structure of baseball, the English sport of cricket came to inspire baseball founders, whoever they were, and gave the game a sense of standardization in rules and scoring. The framework of interclub matches, even including the British ideals of amateurism, coupled with behavior becoming a gentleman. In 1845, a man came onto the scene who changed the informal play styles of the time into a more organized form. His name, Alexander Cartwright. A banker in New York City, Cartwright was involved in many civic causes. History points to the name of Cartwright's club, the Knickerbockers being taken from the New York Volunteer Fire Company. Cartwright certainly jumped into this emerging American sport with both feet. His credits are many and various, all intended to improve the overall image and form of baseball. Early club rules require that the players have the reputation of a gentleman, as well as play strictly as an amateur. The New York Knickerbockers were the first team to play ball by Cartwright's rule system. On June 19, 1846, the first interclub game in baseball history was played at Elysian Fields in Hoboken, New Jersey. 
For the Knickerbockers, the players were, for the most part, white-collar workers from the financial district. The visiting team for the event was the New York Nine, and they beat the home team 23-1. to Cartwright's 20-game rules included a playing area in the shape of a diamond with flat bases 90 feet apart. There were nine men on a side. The pitcher's balk rule was established. The definitions for a fair or foul ball were set. There would be three strikes to an out and three outs to a side. Cartwright ruled that the game continued until 21 runs were scored, as opposed to our modern nine innings. Most of Cartwright's rules still exist today. The game of base ball, two separate words, caught on like wildfire. Beginning in New York City in the 1840s, thence to Brooklyn, with clubs called the Gothams, Eckfords, Putnams, Empires, Unions, Atlantics, and the Excelsiors, originally called the Jolly Young Bachelors. From its New York beginnings, baseball spread like wildfire to the greater United States beyond. By the time the Civil War ended, baseball had gained the cliché of being called our national pastime. The Knickerbockers Club meetings, overseen by Alexander Cartwright, were the origination of the first formal authority on the sport. The Knickerbockers then sponsored meetings with other New York clubs, which led to the National Convention. Out of that event came a formal association with elected officials for the game. In 1857, most of those officials were Knickerbockers. By 1858, change had happened so rapidly that none of the elected officials were Knickerbockers. a new set of rules was adopted during a convention of 16 ball clubs from the New York and Brooklyn areas. The new rules were written by Henry Chadwick, a reporter who covered baseball for the New York Times, as well as for the World, the Herald, the Evening Telegraph, and other daily papers in the U.S. Chadwick wanted to rid the sport of various corruptions such as alcoholism and gambling. During this non-Knickerbocker convention, the rules adopted were quite similar to Cartwright's, with the exception that nine innings would count as a game, as opposed to the former 21 runs. The convention created the National Association of Baseball Players with 26 teams in that first year. The association also formed a rules committee to present annual changes to its members. In 1858, for the first time, an admission of 50 cents was charged. That year also saw a best two out of three all-star game. The series was held at a horse racing track, the Fashion Race Course, near what is now Queens, since a large crowd was expected. New York won over Brooklyn two games to one. Brooklyn did emerge, however, as a new center of baseball influence, with four of the top teams from 1858 regular season being Brooklyn teams. More and more Americans were playing baseball, and more and more merchants of the day discovered that baseball could make them money. The bat and ball games found enterprising merchants on the field of play, touting better equipment and even better looking uniforms. Things were, as they say, moving. In 1858, Alexander Cartwright introduced in rapid succession 
some ideas which went to the heart of our modern baseball game. They were the box score, as well as the first printed rule book and scorecard. Among the other firsts in the national pastime, by 1860, the number had increased to 62. Then, the Civil War intruded. Baseball felt the rent in the American fabric. Many baseball athletes became part of the Warriors on both sides of the Mason-Dixon line. The sport progressed, however. At the 1861 convention, a mere 28 clubs were in attendance. The same year, Brooklyn won the New York Clippers Silver Ball. It was awarded as a publicity move by the New York Clipper newspaper. The Silver Ball was the trophy for the winner of the series of matches held between Brooklyn and New York's all-star teams. Brooklyn fielded a team which included Dickie Pierce, Al Reach, and James Creighton, the best of the best. The convention in 1862 added more rules. In 1863, saw the pitcher limited to a box like 12 feet by 3 feet. The war may have occupied America's psyche, but baseball games were its war relief. In 1865, with the war over, those who could return to the game did so, both players and fans alike. In a match held at Elysian Fields between the Atlantics and the Mutuals of New York, 20,000 fans watched as the Atlantics carried the day, 13 to 12. The sport of baseball is unique in its type of competition. Mostly, it is a one-on-one -on -one game, the batter versus the pitcher. The outfield, certainly important, was the pitcher's support. As runs scored began to slide, many people saw the changes as improvement or degradation. No less an authority than Henry Chadwick felt the pitchers whose increased spinning the ball, called jerking, a pitch previously banned, was bringing a scientific quality to the game. As crowds increased, the professional levels of conduct sank even lower. In 1865, baseball suffered the first scandal, an error-filled game between the Eckfords and the Mutuals. An investigation showed that game fixing had occurred, and three members of the losing mutuals were suspended for several years. It is my belief that baseball is loved by an entire nation because it embodies that priceless spirit of equality that is the very backbone of America itself. Baseball continued to grow. Scalpers got the pricely sum of $5 for what were 25 cent tickets. In today's dollars, that would mean several hundred dollars in the scalpers' hands. 8,000 people paid to watch the 1866's World Championship game. It was held in Philadelphia and the contest pitted that city's athletics against the Brooklyn Atlantics. The game was notable due to being canceled after drinking and betting patrons caused a riot. After moving to the Union grounds in Brooklyn, the Atlantics won on their home turf, taking two games out of three. On a more positive level, 202 clubs showed up for the 1866 convention, up from the 1860s, 62 clubs. In 1867, the unions of Morrisonia, an area which is the Bronx today, won over the Brooklyn Atlantics in that year's championship game. Championship, however, was becoming a very loose term. A game was a championship if you called it one. Eighteen sixty-eight, and changes were afoot. Remember the ideal of baseball players being gentlemen and amateur players? Players jumped throughout the association, changing their contracts by whim. Wait a minute. Amateurs? 
and contracts? The association had to deal with what had become de facto professional aspects in a so-called amateur sport. New classifications for teams and players created several levels. The top level were, say it quietly now, pros. In 1869, the association is a bowl of jelly on its way to the floor. The Cincinnati Red Stockings decided to raid other clubs for their best players. Cost be hanged. The Reds paid top dollar in those days, being $600 per year for the utility players and growing up to $1,400 paid to then hotshot Georgie Wright. The Reds expected returns for their largesse. The club insisted that players stay in good physical shape train constantly, and play throughout hard-fought games. Naturally, they came to dominate the season. Out of that experience came the realization that if baseball was handled as a professional sport, the rewards would come. In July 1869, a second team chose to become professional. The New York Mutuals used the Reds' rules as their rules topping them with written penalties for any infractions. Also in 1869, the Reds coach Harry Wright used hand signals for the first time during a game. The Red Stockings swept away every team in its path, gaining national renown. By the completion of the season of 69, the Reds were 57 and 0. They would not experience defeat at any team's hands until June of 1870 in a game with the Brooklyn Atlantics, which they lost. In September of 1870, the Chicago White Stockings, also taking a page from the Red Stockings prize-winning formula, went on to win on two separate contests against Cincinnati. Losing the unbeaten track record was the undoing of the Golden Goose. By the end of 1870, the Reds were bankrupt and ceased to exist. In this hurly-burly time, the Jell-O Bowl hit the floor. Hard. The association was changed forever when a split took place between the so-called amateurs and the professionals. Ten teams were left under the moniker of professional after the amateurs took a hike from the association. On St. Patrick's Day in a New York City bar, the National Association of Professional Baseball Players was formed, becoming the first official professional group. Every team but one paid the $10 annual fee to enter the 1871 season in order to compete for and win what was for the first time called the pennant victory. But it was not enough. The National Association suffered from internal shortcomings such as corruption, and by 1876 would be supplanted by the National League. It has been said that the association was killed through inept leadership, too much open gambling, and the general drunkenness of players. In 1875, half the teams in the association played incomplete schedules. In that year, the champion Boston Red Sox had a winning percentage of 899, while the lowest team averaged below 200. In Chicago, William Hulbert, the owner of the White Stockings, hatched a bold plan, which ultimately changed the picture of baseball. Hulbert was not above lining his pockets with silver, mined from baseball's raw ores. He was armed with cash and had a mission to create the best ball club possible. Putting Hulbert's grand scheme into action on February 2nd, 1876, several prominent businessmen met in the Grand Central Hotel in New York City. They formed the National League, baseball's first professional league. The National League named a president, Morgan Bulkelly but had as behind-the-scenes commander, William Hulbert. By creating a new league, Hulbert had, for once and for all, squashed any possibility of an organized association's 
protest to his forays on other clubs. He had gotten rid of all the problems he might have faced by staying within the association. Hulbert rolled up his sleeves and put his cash to work. Four of the Red Stockings players, arguably the best four, Al Spaulding, Ross Barnes, Deacon White, and Cal McVeigh were lured to Chicago. Philadelphia Athletic star Adrian Anson, a youthful hitter, decided to travel west to the Windy City. After carving up the turkey, the National Association had become the National League and had these ten charter members. Boston, Chicago, Cincinnati, St. Louis, Hartford, New York, Philadelphia, and Louisville. In the National League opening game, in the centennial year of the American Revolution, on April 22, 1876, at Philadelphia, Boston defeated the home team 6-5, with 3,000 fans present. The winning Boston pitcher, Joe Borden, had become the owner of several achievements. One year earlier in the association, he had the first professional no-hits game and would go on to also pitch the first no-hitter in the National League. In spite of Borden's work, the Red Stockings finished no closer to the top than fourth. Hulbert's strategy was really working. The captain of his team was Al Spaulding, leading the league in his pitching. Spaulding would later become an entrepreneur of the highest waters creating a virtual monopoly in all forms of baseball as well as other sports gear. Modern fans would certainly have a jolly time watching the play styles of that youthful era. Gloves of any size were seldom used by fielders. Catchers were behind the batters only when there were runners on base. The batters had the option of calling for high or low pitches and the pitcher was working a 50-foot mound to home plate distance. Playing conditions were not terribly attractive. Players used chewing tobacco seemingly as part of the job. The balls would become grimed with the combination of dirt and tobacco juice, disappearing into unkempt playing fields. Umpires were volunteers receiving no pay for their duties. As an aside, remember the Cincinnati Red Stockings? Following the hubris of their early years and subsequent disappearance after their no losses record ran out, the club was reconstituted as a charter member of the National League in 1876. But the magic wasn't to be. The Red Stockings ended up in the cellar of the league with a 9 and 56 tab. From its first moments, the National League's overseers put forward a more professional way of acting, as well as appearing to act. The League faced ups and downs for the next several years. Several times, the League appeared in danger of folding. By 1881, more than a few clubs started to make a respectable profit. So what was on the horizon? More roller coaster trips as Hulbert died in 1882, leaving the league to wallow unguided through the marshlands. Then Cincinnati, Louisville, and Baltimore joined Philadelphia and Pittsburgh, creating the National League's rival, the American Association. The association broke several cardinal rules of the leagues. Playing on Sunday was allowed cutting the admission from 50 cents to a quarter, and allowing beer sales in the park did what was needed. The association soon became an equal to the league, helped along by generous applications of showmanship and continued raids on league rosters. The personalities of the players started to become part of the American consciousness. 
names such as Dave Orr, Pete Browning, Wee Willie Keeler. Businessmen were not slow to pick up on that. In 1878, baseball cigarette cards were originated. For whatever reason, posed studio pictures were on pieces of cardboard that were used as cigarette package stiffeners. Baseball management worked diligently to protect their investment. In 1879 came the creation of the Reserve Clause. Originally designed to bind the top five players on a team, the clause was expanded later to include all players, a form of insurance to keep teams from predatory raids. The need for something like the Reserve Clause was amply demonstrated when in 1884, the St. Louis Maroons, a team created by profligate money deals, became so powerful that the fans lost interest in the baseball action by midsummer causing the Union League to lose a lot of money. The Maroons finished that year at a 94-19 record. Another group, the Union Association, was begun in 1884 by Henry Lucas, a realtor in St. Louis. Lucas believed that the Reserve Clause of 1879 was unfair to players. The clause bound players to their teams. Well equipped in playing ability as well as in haberdashery, a baseball player before the turn of the century started to become a figure of some fame. For instance, there was the St. Louis Browns, managed by Charles Comiskey. The Browns won four straight American Association pennants, beginning in 1885. The Browns owner, Chris Vondre, made his fortune in the saloon and grocery businesses. He certainly had his bases covered before he became a baseball magnet. The only fly in the ointment was that Vondere insisted on telling Comiskey how to run the team. Charlie Comiskey revolutionized the first base defense tactics, covering a wide area by playing well off the base. Comiskey later would also make a fortune off the baseball game. In 1886, the Browns won the series, defeating the Chicago White Stockings. But their wins were not to be long run. 1887 would enjoy the spectacle of the National League's Detroit team defeating the Browns. In 1888, the Browns lost to the Giants. The star of the 1888 series was John Montgomery Ward, nicknamed Gents. Ward, the Browns' captain and shortstop, starred at stealing bases. In the 80s and 90s, the interest in baseball increased. Intending to hold on to the best players, the president of the American Association, H.D. McKnight, declared that no team or player could play with any National League team under threat of expulsion from the association. Understand that the leagues or associations really had one core asset, their audience customers, the fans. Baseball came to realize that fans would pay money to come to ballparks to watch the action. Building actual ballparks instead of operating in open fields, fairgrounds, or stadiums, owners came to reap greater rewards in baseball's future. In response to a ceiling placed on baseball players' salaries, the National Brotherhood of Professional Baseball Players was formed in 1885. The players of the time elected star pitcher John Montgomery Ward to be their spokesman in dealing with the club owners. The Brotherhood thus became baseball's first labor organization. The club owners refused to see Ward, who then met in secret with Cleveland rail magnet Albert Johnson. Through good, solid American financial know-how, the Brotherhood put ballparks in all but one of the National League cities. Ultimately, the Brotherhood would create the Players' League. The plan approached success as most of the older league stars were drawn into the scheme. The association was so badly hit that Louisville, the club in the cellar in 1888, 
won the 1890 Association pennant. Louisville went from last to first, in one season a record of its own in the annals of the sport. The 1890 season was notable for more than a few reasons. Primary astonishment might be to the 2020 perspective of hindsight. The Players League plan was working out well. The National League was hurting due to the upstarts. But for some inexplicable reason, the Players League didn't realize their advantage. Just on the eve of what could have been conquest, the players folded with the league members allowed back to their original teams with no National League reprisals. The American Association was foundering on the financial shoals and it also folded. There was one group left and it was the National League. In the 80s and 90s, Hugh Duffy of Boston became a heavy hitter at home plate. Pitcher Candy Cummings made many batters weep at the sight of his invention, the curveball. Other memorable players included Wee Willie Keeler, whose slogan was, I hit them where they ain't, and Clark Griffith, a pitcher who ended up playing in both leagues, not at the same time, of course. Griffith's trails happily ended in Washington as head of the Senators, completing a lifetime solid play in baseball. Native American Indian and black players were also seen near the turn of the century. For instance, there was Chief Bender, a Chippewa Indian. There was Moses Fleetwood Walker, the first black major leaguer. He joined Toledo in 1884, along with his brother, Welday Walker. By 1892, the 24 teams of 1890 became 12 teams. In the process, getting rid of the lesser abilities, especially in the Department of Pitching. Cy Young and Amos Russey, as an example, were premier pitchers. Batters' averages sunk to abysmal levels. Cap Anson, who was also part owner of the White Stockings, gained a lowly 272. Marty Ward was at 265, and King Kelly had sunk to 265. The solution was to move the pitcher further from the batter. From 50 feet even, to 60 feet and 6 inches distance. This is the same as modern baseball's playing field geometry. It still works well today. Players had an initial advantage. Salaries were increasing. As an example, Ed Delahanty, who played infield, was making $2,500 per year. This in a time when bread was two loaves for a nickel and a pair of new shoes was a mere $4.50. Salaries were spiraling dramatically upward through the turn of the century. Well, the turn of the century came and went. Suddenly, in a new era, baseball was even more the American pastime. 1903. The first modern World Series took place in 1903. The game? featured the inspired pitching of a baseball immortal, Cy Young. Young was destined to become the winner of the most games in baseball history. 511 winning events. Other people destined to become immortal through baseball? Christy Matheson, who would later be one of the first five men inducted into baseball's Hall of Fame. Roger Bresnahan, catcher, who would come to invent shin guards, but whose ball diamond field work was on a par with the best of the time. On the New York Giants roster were incomparables like Joe McGinty, a batter whose nickname was Iron Man. The Highlanders, later to become the New York Yankees, 
had a star pitcher, one Jack Chesbro, who won 41 games in 1904. Another Highlander, Hal Chase, could magically turn hits into outs at first, winning fans raves. There was also an aging but agile wee Willie Keeler, who won his kudos as an outstanding batter. Coming on the scene was another man destined for lasting immortality. He was Tyrus R. Cobb. More experts have called Ty Cobb the greatest all-around player. The Georgia Peach would go on to dominate the sport for more than 25 years. Cobb won 12 American League batting championships, nine consecutively, and achieved a lifetime batting average of 367. Three times, Cobb hit over 400 in a season, and he also managed to steal some 900 bases in his lifetime. Cobb was as aggressive a player as they come. Another legend, Connie Mack, said of Cobb, Ty never let his incredible achievements slow him down or make him complacent. The American League was monopolized batting-wise by Ty Cobb from 1907 to 1919. The only exception was another legend, Tris Speaker. As a premier defensive outfielder, Speaker was fast. In Boston, a legend grew. Speaker was a great defensive outfielder with a 386 average in 1916. Cornelius McGillicuddy, better known as Connie Mack, was diligently becoming a well-known, if not always respected, baseball coach. We know Connie Mack best from his team's records. When he was hot, Philadelphia's athletics won four out of five World Series, glorifying its American League position starting in 1910. But in the next few years when he was cold, Mack's best advice was not good enough, and the athletics spent more than a few years in the cellar. The 1911 World Series, held in the rebuilt polo grounds, held a crowd of more than 38,000 fans. This was the biggest series crowd in the times. These were the years of the Athletics' famed $100,000 infield. The sun smiled on Mac and the Athletics then. They had great pitching with Bender. Coombs and Plank. Avid fans made wagers topping more than $100,000 on just one game. Honus Wagner was becoming a legend in his play with the Giants. Wagner, known as Ham, was a fierce batter. John McGraw gave his pitchers a simple instruction about throwing to Wagner. Chuck the ball as hard as you can and pray. Casey Stingle, who played against Wagner, claims that Honus ruined what would have been Stingle's batting and fielding averages. Whenever I'd play for him in the field, he'd hit it the other way, recalled Casey. In his 1909 series appearance against Detroit, Wagner came up against Ty Cobb. The Pittsburgh Pirates and Wagner won that series four games to three. Wagner led the National League for eight seasons, stealing 720 bases and accruing a lifetime batting average of 329. Boston was the scene for the appearance of another legend of the sport, when George Herman Babe Ruth started his rise to stardom with his curveballs. It was only later that Ruth would become famous for his batting. Another player, this time in the American League, as Napoleon Lahoy, would be the new century's first 400 hitter, reaching that average in 1901. Lahoy, an old-style hitter, choking up on the bat for his hits. The American League was full of talent, so much so that Nat Lahoy and Tris Speaker were penalized, in a sense, 
by the brilliance of league mate Ty Cobb. Had the two men been in the National League, they might have become more well-known than they were. Cobb was a terror on the field. In one season, he stole 96 bases, possibly by his intimidating slides. You see, Cobb was famous for heading to bases, spikes first, slowing down even the most zealous baseman for fear of the Cobb's sharp arrival. Repeating what had happened 70 years earlier, World War I was starting to intrude on the diamond playfield and the bright team uniforms were being traded for the dull, drab military garb. By 1919, Americans were happily worrying about the Reds' White Sox game, which the Reds won five games to three. In 1920, scandal again reared its ugly head with the Black Sox affair. Eight players were banished from the game forever due to their involvement in throwing a game one year earlier. 1920 in the National League, Rogers Hornsby was becoming known as the greatest hitter of the league. He swung a mean bat, but was considered the all-time second baseman. Hornsby was a dedicated player who studied every phase of the game with care and precision. The 1920 series pitted the Brooklyn Dodgers against the Cleveland Indians, with the Indians coming out on top, five games to two. The New York Yankees were not idle either. Spending nearly a half million dollars, they lured Babe Ruth away from the Boston Red Sox putting in place the beginning of the Yankee stellar team. The Yankees would soon make history on several fronts. They dedicated Yankee Stadium in 1922 at the head of their league. They were the first team to have a game broadcast on radio in 1923 when they faced the Giants. Also in 1923, Yankees owner Colonel Rupert asked then commissioner Judge Landis for permission to use a young rookie as a replacement player. That rookie was Lou Gehrig. The Yankees' pennant runs were stopped cold in 1924, despite players such as Gehrig, Ruth, and Stengel. Fans of the Washington Senators found themselves surprised and amazed. Their team defeated the Yankees in that series 4-2. In 1925, the Senators lost their series. Babe Ruth was still making his legend with the Yankees. In September of 1927, he hit his 60th home run in the Yankee Stadium. In that year, the Yankees would become top of their league with 110 wins versus 44 losses with a 19-game lead over second place Philadelphia. George Herman Ruth was born in 1895 in the city of Baltimore, Maryland. His dad was a local saloon owner who had raised George on his own since the death of his mother when he was six years old. By the time George was 18, he was the biggest kid and the best ball player. Jack Dunn, the owner and manager of the Baltimore Orioles, heard about George and paid him a visit. He signed Ruth to a $600 contract. They flew south for spring training in 1914. To the older players on the Orioles, Ruth was an innocent young kid, and they referred to him as Dunn's newest babe. The nickname stuck, and soon everyone called him Babe. 
Jack Dunn was forced to sell Ruth to the Boston Red Sox to avoid going broke. The Babe quickly became the star of the Red Sox, winning 40 games in only two years. Red Sox manager Ed Farrell put Babe in right field as he made the decision to use Ruth as a hitter. As a pitcher, he'd be unable to play every day, so he was kept in the outfield so he could do what he did best, hit homers. Ruth would never pitch again, and the world of baseball would be forever changed by his mighty bat. Fans would jam ballparks just to see him hit a home run. On August 14th, Ruth hit his 17th home run, which established a new American League record. The legend of Babe Ruth began to grow. In 1920, the New York Yankees paid the highest sum ever paid for a ball player, $150,000 to acquire the services of Babe Ruth. In 1920, Ruth hit 54 home runs. That year, the Yankees became the first team in baseball history to draw over a million fans for a season. Everyone came to see the Babe. Even when he struck out, it was a sight to behold. Babe loved money, booze, food, and women, and he loved to have a good time 24 hours a day. Babe knew who he was, and he ruled baseball. He did what he wanted, never shaking his childhood disrespect of authority. Babe even appeared with funny man Harold Lloyd. Thank you.